Act One of Aura, A Tragedy in Five Acts by Joanna Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aura, A Tragedy in Five Acts by Joanna Bailey Persons of the Drama Men Hugobert, Count of Aldenburg Read by Roger Moline Glottenball, his son Read by Craig Franklin Theobald of Falkenstein, a nobleman of reduced fortune and Coburger of Basel. Read by Todd. Rediger, a knight, and commander of one of the free companies returned from the wars, and bastard of a branch of the family of Aldenburg. Read by Thomas Peter. Hartman, friend of Theobald, and banneret of Basel. Read by Philip Gould. Erston, a confessor. Read by Recording Person. Franco, chief of a band of outlaws. Read by Nemo. Maurice, an agent of Rudiger's. Read by Larry Wilson. Soldier. Read by David Olson. Vassal. Read by Joseph Tabler. Attendant. Read by Victor Vizarraza. Outlaws. Read by Owen Cook. Read by David Olson. Servants. Read by Sandra Schmidt. Read by T. J. Burns. Women. Aura, heiress of another branch of the family of Aldenburg, and ward to Hugobert. Read by Abai. Eleonora, wife to Hugobert. Read by Eva Davis. Katharina. Read by Sonia. Alice. Read by Lian Yao. Ladies attending on Aura. Stage directions. Read by Chuck Williamson. Scene. Switzerland. In the canton of Basel and afterwards in the borders of the black forest in Suabia. Time, towards the end of the fourteenth century. Act One, Scene One. An open space before the walls of a castle, with wild mountains beyond it. Enter Glottenball, armed as from the lists, but bareheaded and in disorder, and his arms soiled with earth or sand, which an attendant is now and then brushing off, whilst another follows, bearing his helmet. With him enters Maurice, followed by Rudiger, who is also armed and keeps by himself, pacing to and fro at the bottom of the stage whilst the others come forward. Glottenball, speaking as he enters, loud and boastingly. Aye, let him triumph in his paltry honours, won by mere trick and accident. Good faith, it were a shame to call it strength or skill, were it not, Rudiger? Calling to Rudiger, who answers not. His brow is dark, his tongue is locked, my lord. There come no words from him. He bears it not so manfully as thou dost, noble Glottenball. Fie on't! I mind it not. And wherefore shouldst thou? This same Theobald, Count and Kohlberger, mixture most unseemly of base and noble, know we not right well what powers assist him? Mart you not, nay, my lord? How he did turn him to the witchy north when first he mounted, making his fierce steed that pawed and reared and shook its harnessed neck in generous pride bend meekly to the earth, 
its main crest like one who made obeisance. Ha! Didst thou really see it? Yes, brave Glossabal, I did right truly, and besides myself many observed it. Then tis manifest how all this foil hath been. Who e'er before saw one with such advantage of the field lose it so shamefully? By my good fay, barring foul play and other devilish turns, I'd keep my courses back with any lord, or knight, or squire, that e'er bestrode a steed. Think'st thou not, honest Morris, that I could? Who doubts it, my good lord? This Falkenstein is but a clown to you. Well, let him boast. Boasting, I scorn. But I will shortly shew him. What these good arms with no foul play against them can honestly achieve. Yes, good, my lord. But choose you well your day. A moonless Friday luck did never bring to honest combatant. Ha! Blessing on thee! I ne'er thought of this. Now it is clear how our mischance befell. Be sure thou tell to every one thou meet'st. Friday and a dark moon suit Theobald. Ho there! Sir Rudiger, hearst thou not this? Rudiger, as he goes off, aside to Maurice. Let the fool a while, and let me go. I cannot join thee now. Exit. Glottenball, looking after Rudiger. Is he so crestfallen? He lacks your noble spirit. Fie upon it. I heed it not. Yet by my sword and spurs, t'was a foul turn that for my rival earned a branch of victory from Aura's hand. Ay, foul indeed, my blood boiled high to see it. Look where he proudly comes. Enter Theobald, armed, with attendants, having a green sprig stuck in his helmet. Glottenball, going up to Theobald. Comest thou to face me so, audacious burger? The Lady Aura's favour suits thee not, though for a time thou hast upon me gained a seeming vantage. A seeming vantage? Then it is not true that thou, unhorsed, layest rolling in the dust, asking for quarter? Let me crave thy pardon, some strange delusion hung upon our sight that we believed it so. Off with thy taunts, and pull that sprig from its audacious perch, the favour of a dame too high for thee. Too high indeed, and hast thou also added, to good, to fair, I had assented to it. Yet, be it known unto your courteous worth, that were this sprig a queen's gift, or received from the brown hand of some poor mountain maid, yea, or bestowed upon my rambling head, as in the hairy sides of brozening kid the wild rose sticks a spray, unprized, unbidden, I would not give it thee. Dost thou so face me out? Then I will have it. Snatching at it with rage. Enter Hartman. Hartman, separating them. What? Malice? After fighting in the lists as noble courteous knights? Glottenball to Hartman. Go, paltry banneret. Such friends as thou become, such lords as he whose ruined state seeks the base fellowship of restless burghers, thinking to humble still, with envious spite, the great and noble houses of the land. I know ye well, and I defy you both, with all your damned witchery to boot. Exit, grumbling, followed by Maurice, etc. Manet, Theobald, and Hartman. How fierce the creature is, and full of folly! Like a shent cur to his own door retired, that bristles up his furious back, and there each passenger annoys. And this is he, whom sordid and ambitious Hogerbert, the guardian in the selfish father sunk, destines for Aura's husband? Oh, foul shame! The carrion crow and royal eagle joined make not so cross a match. But thinkest thou, Hartman, she will submit to it? That may be as thou pleasest, Falkenstein. Away with mockery! 
I mock thee not. Nay, Benaret, thou dost. Saving this favour, which every victor in these listed combats from ladies' hands receive, nor then regard as more than due and stated courtesy, she ne'er hath honoured me with word or look such hope to warrant. Wait not thou for looks. Thou wouldst not have me to a dame like this, with rich domains and titled rights accompassed, these simple limbs girt in their soldiers' gear, my barren hills and ruined tower present, and say, except these will I nobly give in fair exchange for thee and all thy wealth? No, Rudolph, Hartman, woo the maid thyself if thou hast courage for it. Yes, Theobalda Falkenstein, I will, and win her, too, but all for thy behoof. And when I do present, as thou hast said, those simple limbs, girt in their soldiers' gear, adding thy barren hills and ruined tower with some few items more of generous worth, and native sense, and manly fortitude, I give her in return for all that she or any maid can in such barter yield, its fair and ample worth. So dost thou reckon. And so will Aura. Do not shake thy head, I know the maid, for still she has received me as one who knew her noble father well, and in the bloody field in which he died, fought by his side with kind familiarity. And her stern guardian, viewing these grey hairs and this rough visage with no jealous eye, hath still admitted it. I'll woo her for thee. I do in truth believe thou meanst me well. And this is all thou sayest? Cold, frozen words. What has bewitched thee, man? Is she not fair? Oh, fair indeed, as woman need to be formed to please and be beloved. Though, to speak honestly, I've fairer seen. Yet such a form as Aura's for ever in my busy fancy dwells when e'er I think of wifing my lone state. It is not this. She has too many lures. Why wilt thou urge me on to meet her scorn? I am not worthy of her. Hartman pushing him away with gentle anger. Go to. I praise thy modesty short while, and now with dull and senseless perseverance thou wouldst o'erlay me with it. Go thy ways. If through thy fault, thus shrinking from the onset, she should with this untoward cub be matched, twill haunt thy conscience like a damning sin. And may it gnaw thee, shrewdly. Exeunt. Scene two. A small apartment in the castle. Enter Rudiger, musing gloomily and muttering to himself some time before he speaks aloud. No, no. It is to formless air dissolved, this cherished hope, this vision of my brain. Pacing to and fro, and then stopping and musing as before. Adele stood contrasted in her sight with an ungainly fool, and when she smiled, methought, but wherefore still upon this thought, which was perhaps but a delusion then, put I with ceaseless torment? Never, never, oh, never more on me, from Aura's eye, approving glance shall light, or gentle look. This day's disgrace mars all my goodly dreams. My path to greatness is at once shut up. Still in the dust my groveling fortune lies. Striking his breast in despair. Tame thine aspiring spirit, luckless wretch. There is no hope for thee. And shall I tame it? No, my saints and devils. The laws have cast me off from every claim of house and kindred, and within my veins turned noble blood to baseness and reproach. I'll cast them off, 
Why should they be to me a bar in their protection? Pacing again to and fro, and muttering low for some time, before he speaks aloud. Ay, this may still within my toils enthrall her. This is the secret weakness of her mind on which I'll clutch my hold. Enter Katharina behind him, laying her hand upon him. Huh. Speaks thou to thyself? Redeker, starting. I did not speak. Thou didst. Thy busy mind gave sound to thoughts which thou didst utter with a thick, harsh voice, like one who speaks in sleep. Tell me their meaning. And dost thou so presume? Be wise, be humble. After a pause. His order oft of late requested thee to tell us stories of the restless dead, of spectres rising in the midnight watch by the lone traveller's bed. Wherefore of late dost thou so oft inquire of what she says and does? Be wise, and answer what I ask of thee. This is thy duty now. Alas, alas, I know that one false step has over me said a stern and ruthless master. No, madam, tis thy grave and virtuous seeming, thy saint-like carriage, rigid and demure, on which thy high repute so long has stood, endowing thee with right of censorship o'er every simple maid, whose cheerful youth wears not so thick a mask, that o'er thee sets this ruthless master. Hereon rests my power, I might expose, and therefore I command thee. Hush, hush, approaching steps, they'll find me here. I'll do whatever thou wilt. It is but Maurice. Hie thee to thy closet, where I will shortly come to thee. Be thou my faithful agent in a weighty matter, on which I now am bent, and I will prove thy stay and shelter from the world's contempt. Maurice, to find me here, where shall I hide me? Nowhere, but boldly pass him as he enters. I'll find some good excuse. He will be silent. He was my agent also. Dost thou trust him? Avarice his mast is, as shame is thine. Therefore I trust a deal with both. Away! Enter Maurice, passing Katharina as she goes out. What doth the grave and virtuous Katrina vouchsafe to give thee of her company? Yes, rigid saint, she has bestowed upon me some grave advice to bear with pious meekness my late discomfiture. Ay, and she called it, I could be sworn, heaven's judgment on thy pride. And so, thou hast guessed it. Shall we to the ramparts and meet the western breeze? Exeunt. Scene three. A spacious apartment. Enter Hugobert and Erston. Hugobert, speaking with angry gesticulation as he enters. I feed and clothe these drones, and in return they cheat, deceive, abuse me, nay, belike, laugh in their sleeve the while. By their advice this cursed tourney I proclaimed, for still they puffed me up with praises of my son, his grace, his skill in arms, his horsemanship. Count Falkenstein to him was but a clown. And so, in Ora's eyes to give him honor, full surely did I think, I'll hang them all. I'll starve them in a dungeon shut from light. I'll heap my boards no more with dainty fare to feed false flatterers. That indeed were wise. But art thou sure, when men shall speak the truth, that thou wilt feed them for it? I but hinted in gentle words to thee, that Glottenbar was praised with partial or affected zeal, and thou received it angrily. Aye, true indeed, but thou did speak of him as one bereft of all capacity. Now, though, God wot, I look on his defects with no blind love, and even in my ire will sometimes call him fool. Yet, nevertheless, he still has parts and talents, though obscured by some untoward failings. 
Heaven be praised. He wants not strength at least and well-turned limbs, had they but taught him how to use them. Knaves, they have neglected him. Enter Glottenball, who draws back on seeing his father. Advance, young sir. Art thou afraid of me? That thus thou shrinkest like a skulking thief to make disgrace the more apparent on thee? Yes, uh, call it then disgrace, or what you please. Had not my lance's point somewhat awry glanced on his shield? Even so, I doubt it not. Thy lance's point, and everything about thee hath glanced awry. Go, rid my house, I say, of all these feasting flatterers that deceive thee. They harbor here no more. Dismiss them quickly. Do it yourself, my lord. Uh, you are, I trow, angry enough to do it sharply. Hugobert, turning to Erston. Faith! He jibes me fairly here. There is reason in it. Fools speak not thus. To Glottonball. Go to, if I am angry. Thou art a graceless son to tell me so. Have you not bid me still to speak the truth? Hugobert to Erston. Again thou hearest he makes an apt reply. He wants not words. Nor meaning neither, father. Enter Eleonora. Well, dame, where hast thou been? I came from Aura. Hast thou been pleading in our son's excuse? And how did she receive it? I tried to do it, but her present humor is jest and merriment. She is behind me, stopping to stroke a hound that in the corridor came to her fawningly to be caressed. Glottenball, listening. Aye, she is coming. Light and quick her steps. So sound they when her spirits are unruly. But I am bold. She shall not mock me now. Enter Aura, tripping gaily and playing with the folds of her scarf. Me thinks you trip it briskly, gentle dame. Does it offend you, noble knight? Go to. I know your meaning. Wherefore smile you so? Because, good sooth, with tired and aching sides I have not power to laugh. Full well I know why thou so merry art. Thou thinkst of him to whom thou gavest that sprig of hopeful green his rusty cask to grace, whilst at thy feet his honoured glaive he laid. Nay, rather say of him who at my feet from his proud courser's back more gallantly laid his most precious self, then stole away, through modesty, unthanked, nor left behind of all his gear that fluttered in the dust, or glove, or band, or fragment of torn hose, for dear remembrance sake, that in my sleeve I might have stuck it. Oh, thou wrongst me much, to think my merriment a reference hath to any one but him, <laughs> Nay, Aura, these wild fits of uncurbed laughter athwart the gloomy tenor of your mind, as it has lowered of late, so keenly cast, unsuited seem, and strange. Oh, nothing strange, my gentle Eleonora. Didst thou ne'er see the swallow's veering breast, winging the air beneath some murky cloud in the sun glimpses of a stormy day, shiver in silvery brightness? Or boatman's oar, as vivid lightning flash in the faint gleam, that like a spirit's path tracks the still waters of some sullen lake? Or lonely tower, from its brown mass of woods, give to the parting of the wintry sun one hasty glance in mockery of the night, closing in darkness round it? Gentle friend, tried not her mirth who was sad yesterday, and may be so to-morrow. And wherefore art thou sad, unless it is from thine own wayward humour? Other dames, were they so courted, would be gay and happy. Wayward it needs must be, since I am sad when such perfection woos me. Pray, good Glottenball, how didst thou learn with such a wondrous grace so high in air to toss thine armed heels, 
and clutch with outspread hands the slippery sand? I was the more amazed at thy dexterity, as this, of all thy many gallant feats, beforehand promised most modestly, thou didst forbear to mention. Jibe away! I care not for thy jibing! With fair lists and no black arts against me! Hugobert, advancing angrily from the bottom of the stage to Glottenball. Hold thy peace! To Aura. And, madam, be at least somewhat restrained in your unruly humour. Pardon, my lord, I knew not you were near me. My humour is unruly. With your leave I will retire till I have curbed it better. To Eleonora. I would not lose your company, sweet countess. We'll go together, then. Exeunt Aura and Eleonora. Manet Hugobert who paces angrily about the stage while Glottenball stands on the front, thumping his legs with a sheathed rapier. There is no striving with a forward girl, nor pushing on a fool. My harassed life day after day more irksome grows. Cursed Bane, I'll toil no more for this untoward match. Enter Rudiger, stealing behind and listening. You are disturbed, my lord. What, is it thou? I am disturbed in sooth. Aye, Aura has been here, and some light words of girlish levity have moved you. How? Toy for this match no more. What else remains, if this should be abandoned, noble Altenberg, that can be worth your toil? I'll match the cub elsewhere. What call you matching? Surely for him some other virtuous maid of high descent, though not so richly dowried, may be obtained. Within your walls, perhaps, some waiting gentleman, who perchance may be some fifty generations back descended from a king, he will himself ere long obtain, without your aid, my lord. Thou makest me mad, the dolt, the senseless dolt. What can I do for him? I cannot force a noble maid entrusted to my care. I, the sole guardian of her helpless youth. That were indeed unfit. There are means to make her yield consent. Then by my faith, good friend, I'll call thee wizard, if thou canst find them out. What means already, short of compulsion, have we left untried? And now the term of my authority wears to its close. I know it well, and therefore powerful means, and of quick operation, must be sought. Speak plainly to me. I have watched her long. I have seen her cheek, flushed with the rosy glow of jocund spirits, deadly pale become a tale of nightly sprite or apparition. Such is all here, tis true, with greedy ears, saying, Saints, save us! But forget us quickly. I've marked her long. She has, with all her shrewdness and playful merriment, a gloomy fancy that broods within itself on fearful things. And what doth this avail us? Hear me out. Your ancient castle in the Swabian forest hath, as too well you know, belonging to it, or false or true, frightful reports. There hold her strictly confined in sombre banishment, and doubt not but she will, ere long, fool gladly her freedom purchase at the price you name. On what pretense can I confine her there? It were most odious. Can pretense be wanting? Has she not favour shown to Theobald, who in your neighbourhood, with his sworn friend, the banneret of Basil, suspiciously prolongs his stay. A poor and paltry count, and meet to match with her. And want he then a reason for removing her with speed to some remoter quarter? Out with it. You are too scrupulous. Thy scheme is good, but cruel. Glottenball, who has been drawing nearer to them, and attending to the last part of their discourse, Oh, much I like it. Dearly wicked Rudiger, 
She then will turn her mind to other thoughts than scornful jibes at me. I, to her father, swore I would protect her. I must fulfill his will. And in that will, her father did desire she might be matched with this your only son. Therefore you have firmly bound all means to use that may the end attain. Walk forth with me. We'll talk of this at large. Exeunt Hugobert and Rudiger. Manet Gluttonball, who comes forward from the bottom of the stage with the action of a knight advancing to the charge. Yes, thus it is. I have the slight dot now. And were the combat yet to come, I'd shew them. I'm not a wit behind the bravest knight. Cross luck excepted. Enter Maurice. My lord, indulge us of your courtesy. In what, I pray? Did not Fernando tell you? We are all met within our social bower, and I have wagered on your head that none but you alone within the Count's domains can to the bottom drain the chaste horn. <laughs> Come, do not linger here when glory calls you. Thinkest thou that Theobald could drink so stoutly? He, he paltry chief, he herds with sober burghers. A goblet half its size would conquer him. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of Aura, A Tragedy in Five Acts, by Joanna Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. A garden with trees and shrubs, etc. Aura, Theobald, and Hartman are discovered in a shaded walk at the bottom of the stage, speaking in dumb show, which they cross, disappearing behind the trees, and are presently followed by Katharina and Alice, who continue walking there. Aura, Theobald, and Hartman then appear again entering near the front of the stage. Aura, talking to Hartman as she enters. And so, since fate has made me, woe the day, that poor and good-for-nothing, helpless being, woman ye clept, I must consign myself with all my lands and rights into the hands of some proud man, and say, Take it all, I pray, and do me in return the grace and favour to be my master. Nay, gentle lady, you constrain my words, and load them with a meaning harsh and foreign to what they truly bear. A master? No, a valiant gentle mate, who in the field or in the council will maintain your right. A noble, equal partner. Aura, shaking her head. Well, I know in such a partnership the share of power allotted to the wife. See, noble Falkenstein hath silent been the while, nor spoke one word in aid of all your specious arguments. To Theobald. What's your advice, my lord? Ah, noble Aura, t'were like self-murder to give honest counsel, then urge me not. I frankly do confess I should be more heroic than I am. Right well I see thy head approves my plan, and by and by so will thy generous heart. In short, I would, without another's leave, improve the low condition of my peasants, and cherish them in peace. Even now, methinks, each little cottage of my native vale swells out its earthen sides, upheaves its roof, like to a hillock moved by labouring mole, and with green tailweeds clambering up its walls, Roses in every gay and fragrant plant, before my fancy stands a fairy bower. Ay, and within it too do fairies dwell. Looking playfully through her fingers like a show-glass. 
peep through its wreathed window if indeed the flowers grow not too close and there within thou'lt see some half a dozen rosy brats eating from wooden bowls their dainty milk those are my mountain elves seest thou not their very forms distinctly distinctly and most beautiful the sight a sight which sweetly stirreth in the heart feelings that gladden and ennoble it dancing like sunbeams on the rippled sea a blessed picture foul befell the man whose narrow selfish soul would shade or mar it to this right heartily i say amen but if there be a man whose generous soul like ardor fills turning to aura who would with thee pursue thy generous plan who would his harness don aura putting her hand on him in gentle interruption nay valiant banneret who would and please you his harness doff all feuds all strife forbear all military rivalship all lust of added power and live in steady quietness a mild and fostering lord know you of one that would so share my task you answer not and your brave friend methinks casts on the ground a thoughtful look to theobald what's he of such a lord what i of such a lord no noble aura i do not nor does hartman though perhaps his friendship may betray his judgment no none such exist we are all fierce contentious restless and proud and prone to vengeful feuds the very distant sound of war excites us like the curbed courser listening to the chase who paws and frets and bites the rein trust none to cross thy gentle but most princely purpose who hath on a head a circling helmet wore or ever grasped the glaive but ne'ertheless there is i know a man might i be bold being so honest boldness is your right permitted then i'll say i know a man though most unworthy or as lord to be who as her champion friend devoted soldier might yet commend himself and so received who would at her command for her defence his sword right proudly draw an honoured sword like that which at the gate of paradise from steps profane the blessed region guarded thanks to the generous knight i also know the man thou wouldst commend and when my state such service needeth to no sword but his will i that service owe most noble aura greatly is he honoured and will not murmur that a higher wish too high and too presumptuous is repressed kissing her hand with great respect nay rodolph hartman clear that cloudy brow and look on falkenstein and on myself as two co-burgers of thy native city for such i mean ye long to be and claiming from thee as cadets from an elder born thy cheering equal kindness enter a servant the count is now at leisure to receive the lord of falkenstein and rudolf hartmann we shall attend him shortly exit servant aside to theobald must we now our purposed suit to some pretended matter of slighter import change theobald to hartman aside assuredly madam i take my leave with all devotion i with all friendly wishes exeunt theobald and hartman Katharina and Alice now advance through the shrubs, etc., at the bottom of the stage, while Aura remains wrapped in thought on the front. Madam, you're thoughtful. Something occupies your busy mind. Uh, what was it we talked of when the worthy banneret with Falkenstein upon our converse broke? How we should spend our time when in your castle you shall your state maintain in ancient splendour with all your vessels round you ay so it was and you did say my lady it should not be a cold unsocial grandeur that you would keep the while a merry house oh doubt it not 
I'll gather round my board all that heaven sends to me of wayworn folks, and noble travellers, and neighbouring friends, both young and old. Within my ample hall, the worn-out man of arms, of whom too many, nobly descended, rove like reckless vagrants from one proud chieftain's castle to another, half chid, half honoured, shallow tiptoe tread tossing his grey locks from his wrinkled brow with cheerful freedom as he boasts his feats of days gone by music will have and oft the bickering dance upon our oaken floors shall thundering loud strike on the distant ear of knighted travellers who shall gladly bend their doubtful footsteps towards the cheering din solemn and grave and cloistered and demure we shall not be will this content ye damsels oh passing well twill be a pleasant life free from all stern subjection blithe and fanciful we'll do whate'er we list that right and prudent is i hope thou meanest why ever so suspicious and so strict how couldst thou think i had another meaning to aura and shall we ramble in the woods full oft with hound and horn that is my dearest joy thou runst me fast good alice do not doubt this shall be wanting to us every season shall have its suited pastime even winter in its deep noon when mountains piled with snow and choked up valleys from our mansion bar all entrance and nor guest nor traveller sounds at our gate the empty hall forsaking in some warm chamber by the crackling fire will hold our little snug domestic court plying our work with song and tale between and stories too i ween of ghosts and spirits and things unearthly that on michael's eve rise from the yawning tombs thou thinkest then one night of the year is truly more horrid than the rest perhaps it's only silly superstition but yet it is well known the count's brave father would rather on a glacier's point have lain by angry tempests rocked than on that night sunk in a downy couch in brunier's castle how pray what fearful thing did scare him so hast thou never heard the story of count hugo his ancestor who slew the hunter knight tell it i pray thee katharina tell it not it is not right such stories can ever change her cheerful spirits to gloomy pensiveness her rosy bloom to the wan colour of a shrouded course to aura what pleasure is there lady when thy hand cold as the valley's ice with hasty grasp seizes on her who speaks while thy shrunk form cowering and shivering stands with keen turned ear to catch what follows of the pausing tale and let me cowering stand and be my touch the valley's ice there is a pleasure in it say'st thou indeed there is a pleasure in it yeah when the cold blood shoots through every vein when every hair spit on my shrunken skin a knotted knoll becomes and to mine ears strange inward sounds awake and to mine eyes rush stranger tears there is a joy in fear catching hold of katharina tell it katrina for the life within me beats thick and stirs to hear it he slew the hunter knight since i must tell it then the story goes that grim count aldenburg the ancestor of hugobert and also of yourself from hatred or from envy to his castle a noble knight who hunted in the forest well the black forest named basely decoyed and there within his chamber murdered him merciful heaven and in my veins there runs a murderous blood saidst thou not murdered him ay as he lay asleep at dead of night <gasps> a deed most horrible it was on michael's eve and since that time the neighbouring hinds oft hear the midnight yell of spectre hounds and see the spectre shapes of huntsmen on their sable steeds with still a nobler hunter riding in their van 
to cheer the chase shown by the moon's pale beams when wanes its horn in long october nights this hath been often seen ay so they say but as the story goes on michael's eve and on that night alone of all the year the hunter knight himself having a horn thrice sounded at the gate the castle enters and in the very chamber where he died calls on his murderer or in his default some true descendant of his house to loose his spirit from its torment for his body is laid in the earth unblessed and none can tell the spot of its interment call on some true descendant of his race it were to such a fearful interview but in that chamber on that night alone hath he elsewhere to any of the race appeared or hath he power nay nay forbear see how she looks to aura i fear thou art not well there is a sickly faintness come upon me and didst thou say there is a joy in fear my mind of late has strange impressions taken i know not how it is a few nights since stealing a tiptoe softly through your chamber towards my own oh heaven defend us didst thou see aught there only your sleeping self but you appeared distressed and troubled in your dreams and once i thought to wake you ere i left the chamber but i forbore and glad i am thou didst it is not dreams i fear for still with me there is an indistinctness o'er them cast like the dull gloom of misty twilight where before my eyes pass all incongruous things huge horrible and strange on which i stare as idiots do upon this changeful world with no surprise nor speculation no dreams i fear not it is the dreadful waking when in deep midnight stillness the roused fancy takes up the imperfect shadows of its sleep like a marred speech snatched from a bungler's mouth shaping their forms distinctively and vivid to visions horrible this is my bane it is the dreadful waking that i fear well speak of other things thou in good time your ghostly father comes with quickened steps like one who bears some tidings good or ill heaven grant they may be good enter erston father you seem disturbed daughter i am in truth disturbed the count all of a sudden being much enraged that falconstein still lingers near these walls resolved to send thee hence to be a while in banishment detained till on his son thou lookest with better favour ay indeed that is to say perpetual banishment a sentence light or heavy as the place is sweet or irksome he would send me to he will contrive to make it doubt him not irksome enough therefore i would advise thee to feign at least but for a little time a disposition to obey his wishes he's stern but not relentless and his dame the gentle eleanor will still befriend you when occasion serves what saidst thou father to feign a disposition to obey i did mistake thy words no gentle daughter so pressed thou mayst feign and yet be blameless a trusty guardian's faith with thee he holds not and therefore thou art free to meet his wrongs with what defence thou hast nay pardon me i with an unshorn crown must hold the truth in plain simplicity and am in nice distinctions most unskilful lady have i deserved this sharpness of thy infant hand has stroked the shaven ground thou hast ne'er to now reproached it aura bursting into tears pardon oh pardon me my gentle erston pardon a wayward child whose eager temper doth sometimes mar the kindness of her heart father am i forgiven hanging on him thou art thou art thou art forgiven more than forgiven my child then lead me to the count i will myself learn his stern purpose in the hall he is seated in state and waiting to receive you 
Exeunt. Scene three. A spacious apartment or baron's hall with a chair of state. Hugobert, Eleonora, and Glottenball enter near the front, speaking as they enter. And afterwards enter vassals and attendants who range themselves at the bottom of the stage. Cease, dame, I will not hear. Thou strivest in vain with thy weak pleadings. Aura hence must go within the hour, unless she will engage her plighted word to marry Glottenball. Ay, and a mighty hardship by the mass. I've summoned her in solemn form before me, that these my vassals, should my act approve, knowing my right of guardianship, and also that her late father, in his dying moments, did will she would be married to my son, which will she now must promise to obey or take the consequence. But why so hasty? Why, sayest thou? Falkenstein still in these parts lingers with sly intent. Even now he left me after an interview of small importance, which he and Hartman, as a blind pretense for seeing Aura, formally requested. I say again she must forthwith obey me, or take the consequences of wayward will. Nay, not for Aura do I now entreat, so much as for thyself. Bethink thee well what honour thou shalt have, when it is known thy ward from thy protecting roof was sent, thou who should be to her a friend, a father. But do I send her unprotected? No. Brave Rudiger conducts her with a band of trusty spearmen. In her new abode she will be safe as here. Ha, <sighs> Rudiger! Puts thou such trust in him? Alas, my lord, his heart is full of cunning and deceit. Wilt thou to him, the flower of all thy race, rashly entrust? Oh, be advised, my lord! Thy ghostly father tells thee so, I doubt not. Another priest confesses Rudiger, and Erston likes him not. But canst thou think, with aught but honest purpose, he would choose from all her women the severe Katrina, so strictly virtuous, for her companion? This puts all doubt to silence. Say no more, else I shall think thou pleadest against my son, more with a stepdame's than a mother's feelings. Ay! Marry does she, father, and forsooth regards me as a fool. No marvel then that Aura scorns me, being taught by her. How should she else so to consider me? Hugobert to Glottenball. Tut, hold thy tongue. He wrongs me much, my lord. No more, for here she comes. Enter Aura attended by Erston, Alice, and Katharina, and Hugobert seats himself in his chair of state, the vassals, etc., ranging themselves on each side. Hugobert to Aura. Madam and ward place under my authority, and to my charge committed by my kinsman, Ulric of Aldenburg, thy noble father, having all gentle means essayed to win thee to the fulfilment of his dying will, that did decree his heiress should be married with Glottenball, my heir. I solemnly now call upon thee, ere that rougher means be used for this good end, to promise truly thou wilt, within a short and stated time, before the altar, give thy plighted faith to this my only son. I wait thine answer. Aura of Aldenburg, wilt thou do this? Count of the same, my lord and guardian, I will not. Have a care, thou forward maid. Tis thy last opportunity. Ere long thou shalt, within a dreary dwelling pent, count thy dull hours, told by the dead man's watch, and wish thou hadst not been so proudly willful. And let my dull hours by the dead man's watch be told, yea, make me too the dead man's mate, my dwelling place the nailed coffin. 
still I would prefer it to the living lord your goodness offers me. Art thou bewitched? Is he not young, well-featured, and well-formed? And dost thou put him in thy estimation with bones and sheeted clay? Beyond endurance is thy stubborn spirit. Right well thy father knew that all thy sex stubborn and headstrong are. Therefore, in wisdom, he vested me with power that might compel thee to what he willed should be. Oh, not in wisdom. Say rather in that weak but generous faith, which said to him the cope of heaven would fall and smother in its cradle his swathed babe, rather than thou, his mate in arms, his kinsman, who by his side in many a field had fought, shouldst take advantage of his confidence for sordid ends. My brave and noble father, a voice comes from thy grave and cries against it, and bids me to be bold. Thine awful form rises before me, and that look of anguish on thy dark brow. Oh, no, I blame thee not. Thou seemst beside thyself with such wild gestures and strangely flashing eyes. Repress these fancies, and to plain reason listen. Thou hast said, for sordid ends I have advantage taken. Since thy brave father's death, by war and compact, thou of thy lands hast lost a third, whilst I, by happy fortune, in my heir's behalf, have doubled my domains to what they were when Ulrich chose him as a match for thee. Oh, and what speaketh this, but that my father domains regarded not, and thought a man such as the son should be of such a man as thou to him appearedst, a match more honourable than one of ampler state. Take thou from Glottenball the largely added lands of which thou boastest, and put in lieu thereof into his stores some weight of manly sense and generous worth, and I will say thou keepst faith with thy friend. But as it is, although a king's domains increase to thy wealth, thou poorly wouldst deceive him. Hugobert, rising from his chair in anger. Now, madam, be all counsel on this matter between us closed. Prepare thee for thy journey. Nay, good my lord, consider. Hugobert to Eleonora. What, again? Have I not said thou hast an alien's heart from me and mine? Learn to respect my will. Be silent as becomes a youthful dame. For a few days may she not still remain? No, priest, not for an hour. It is my pleasure that she for Brunier's castle do set forth without delay. Aura, with a faint starting movement. In Brunier's castle? Aye, and doth this change the color of thy cheek, and give thy altered voice a feebler sound? Aside to Glottenball. She shrinks, now to her boy, this is thy time. Glottenball to Aura. Unless thou wilt, thou needest not go at all. There is full many a maiden would right gladly accept the terms we offer and remain. A pause. Wilt thou not answer me? I heard thee not. I heard thy voice, but not thy words. What saidst thou? I say, this many a maiden would right gladly accept the terms we offer and remain. The daughter of a king hath matched ere now with mine inferior. We are linked together as twere by right and natural property, and as I've said before, I say again, I love thee too. What more couldst thou desire? I thank thee for thy courtship, though uncouth, for it confirms my purpose and my strength grows as thou speak'st, firm like the deep bast rock. To Hugobert. Now for my journey, when you will, my lord, I'm ready. Be it so. On thine own head rest all the blame. Going from her. Perverse past all belief. 
turning round to her sternly. Aura of Aldenburg, wilt thou obey me? Count of that noble house, with all respect, again, I say, I will not. Exit Hugobert in anger, followed by Clottenball, Erston, etc. Manet, only Eleonora, Katharina, Alice, and Aura, who keeps up with stately pride, till Hugobert and all attendants are gone out, and then throwing herself into the arms of Eleonora, gives vent to her feelings. <sighs> Sweet Aura, be not so depressed. Thou goest for a short term, soon to return again. The banishment is mine who stays behind. But I will beg of heaven with ceaseless prayers to have thee soon restored, and, when I dare, will plead with Hugobert on thy behalf. He is not always stern. Thanks, gentle friend. Thy voice to me doth sound like the last sounds of kindly nature. Dearly in my remembrance shall they rest. What sounds, what sights, what horrid intercourse I may, ere we shall meet again be doomed to prove, high heaven alone doth know, if that indeed we ever shall meet again. Falls on her neck and weeps. Nay, nay, come to my chamber. There a while compose your spirits. Be not so depressed. Exeunt. Rediger who has appeared during the last part of the above scene at the bottom of the stage, half concealed as if upon the watch, now comes forward, speaking as he advances. Held firm her pride, till fairly from these walls our journey is begun. Then fortune hail, thy favors are secured. Looking off the stage, Ho, oh, Maurice, there. Enter Maurice. My faithful Maurice, I will speak with thee. I leave thee here behind me. To thy care my interests I commit. Be it thy charge to counteract thy lady's influence, who will entreat her lord the term to shorten of Aura's absence, maiming thus my plan, which must, be like have time to be effected. Be vigilant, be artful, and be sure of thy services I amply will repay. Ay, thou hast said so, and I have believed thee. And dost thou doubt? No. Yet meantime, good sooth, if somewhat of thy bounty I might finger, twere well. I'd like to have some actual proof. Didst thou not promise it? Tis true I did. But other pressing calls have drained my means. And other pressing calls my ebbing faith may also drain, And change my promised purpose. Go to. I know thou art a greedy leech, Though nevertheless thou lovest me. Taking a small case from his pocket, which he opens. Seest thou here? I have no coin, but look upon these jewels. I took them from a knight I slew in battle. When I am Aura's lord, thou shalt receive, were it ten thousand crowns, whate'er their worth, shall by a skilful lapidary be in honesty esteemed. Gives him the jewels. I thank thee, but methinks their lustre's dim. I've seen the stones before upon thy breast in gala days, but never heard thee boast they were of so much value. I was too prudent. I lost the mouse. To no one but thyself would I entrust the secret of their value. Enter servant. Sir Rudiger, the spearmen are without, waiting your further orders for the journey. Rudiger, to servant. I'll come to them anon. Exit servant. Before I go, I'll speak to thee again. Exeunt severally. End of Act Two. Act Three of Aura, a Tragedy in Five Acts, 
by Joanna Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One A forest with a half ruined castle in the background. Seen through the trees by moonlight. Franco and several outlaws are discovered sitting on the ground round a fire with flagons, etc., by them as if they had been drinking. Song of several voices. The chuff and crow to roost are gone, the owl sits on the tree, the hushman wails with feeble moan like infant charity. The wildfire dances on the fen, the red star sheds its ray. Up rouse ye then, my merry men, it is our opening day. Both child and nurse are fast asleep, and closed is every flower, and winking tapers faintly peep high from my lady's bower. Bewildered hinds with shortened ken shrink on their murky way. Up rouse ye then, my merry men, it is our opening day nor board nor garner own we now nor roof nor latch a door nor kind mate bound by holy vow to bless a good man's store noon lulls us in a gloomy den and night is grown our day up rouse ye then my merry men and use it as ye may franco to first outlaw how likes thou this fernando well sung in faith but serving ill our turn, who would all travellers and benighted folks scare from our precincts. Such sweet harmony will rather tempt invasion. Fear not for mingled voices heard afar, through glade and glen and thicket stealing on to distant listeners, seem wild goblin sounds, at which the lonely traveller checks his steed, pausing with long-drawn breath and keen-turned ear and twilight pilferers cast down in haste their ill-got burthens while the homeward hind turns from his path full many a mile about through bog and mire to grope his blundering way such to the startled ear of superstition were seraph songs could we like seraph sing enter first outlaw hastily disperse ye different ways we are undone how sayst thou shrinking poltron we undone outlawed and ruined men who live by daring a train of armed men some noble dame escorting so their words discovered as unperceived i hung upon the rear are close at hand and mean to pass the night within the castle some benighted travellers bold from their numbers who ne'er have heard the ghostly legend of this dreaded place let us keep close within our vaulted haunts the way to which is tangled and perplexed and cannot be discovered with the morn they will depart nay by the holy mass within those walls not for a night must travellers quietly rest or few or many would we live securely we must uphold the terrors of the place therefore let us prepare our midnight rouse see from the windows of the castle gleam light seen from the castle quick passing lights as though they moved within in hurried preparation and that bell bell heard which from yon turret its shrill larum sends betokens some unwanted stir come hearts be all prepared before the midnight watch the fiend-like din of our infernal chase around the walls to raise come night advances exeunt scene two a gothic room in the castle with a stage darkened 
Enter Katharina, bearing a light, followed by Aura. Aura, catching her by the robe and pulling her back. Advance no further. Turn, I pray. This room more dismal and more ghastly seems than that which we have left behind. Thy taper's light, as thus aloft thou wavest it to and fro, the fretted ceiling gilds with feeble brightness, whilst overhead its carved ribs glid past like edgy waves of a dark sea, returning to an eclipsed moon its sullen sheen. To me it seems less dismal than the other. See! Here are chairs around the table set, as if its last inhabitants had left it scarcely an hour ago. Setting the light upon the table. Alas, how many hours and years have passed since human forms have round this table set, or lamp or taper on its surface gleamed. Methinks I hear the sound of time long past still murmuring o'er us in the lofty void of those dark arches, like the lingering voices of those who long within their graves have slept. It was their gloomy home. Now it is mine. Sits down, resting her arm upon the table, and covering her eyes with her hand. Enter Rudiger, beckoning Katharina to come to him, and speaks to her in a low voice at the corner of the stage. Go and prepare thy lady's chamber. Why dost thou forever closely near her keep? She charged me so to do. I charge thee also, with paramount authority, to leave her. I for a while will take thy station here. Thou art not mad. Thou dost not hesitate. Fixing his eyes on her with a fierce threatening look, from which she shrinks. Exit Katharina. This was the home of bloody lawless power. The very air rests thick and heavily where murder hath been done. <sighs> there is a strange oppression in my breast. Dost thou not feel a close, unwholesome vapour? Oh, every air to me is light and healthful, that with thy sweet and heavenly breath is mixed. Aura, starting up. Thou here? Looking round. Katrina gone? Does Aura fear to be alone with one whose wheel, whose being on her favour hangs? Retire, Sir Knight. I choose to be alone. And dost thou choose it here, in such a place, wearing so near the midnight hour? Alas, how loathed and irksome must my presence be. Dost thou deride my weakness? I deride it? No, noble maid. Say rather that from thee I have a kindred weakness got. In battle my courage never shrunk, as my armed heel and crested helm do fairly testify. But now, when midnight comes, I feel by sympathy with thinking upon thee. Fears rise within me I never knew before. Ha! Dost thou too such human weakness own? I plainly feel we are all creatures, in the wakeful hour of ghastly midnight, formed to cower together, forgetting all distinctions of the day, beneath its awful and mysterious power. Stealing closer to her as he speaks, and putting his arms round her. Aura, breaking from him. I pray thee, hold thy parley further off. Why dost thou press so near me? And art thou so offended, lovely Aura? Ah, wherefore am I thus presumptuous deemed? The blood that fills thy veins and enriches mine, from the same stock we spring, though by that glance of thy disdainful eye do well I see my birth erroneously thou countest base. Erroneously? Yes, I will prove it so. Long I'll not endure a galling wrong which makes each word of tenderness that bursts from a full heart, bold and presumptuous seem, and severs us so far. No, subtile snake, 
it is the baseness of thy selfish mind full of all guile and cunning and deceit that severs us so far and shall do ever thou prov'st how far my passion will endure unjust reproaches from a mouth so dear out on hypocrisy who but thyself did hugobert advise to send me hither and who the jailer's hateful office holds to make my thraldom sure i prayed me not for this had i refused one less thy friend had ta'en the ungracious task and gentle order dost thou know a man who might and ward all that his soul holds dear from danger keep yet would the charge refuse for that strict right such watcher doth condemn oh, still to be with thee to look upon thee to hear thy voice makes even this place of horus where as tis said the spectre of a chief slain by our common grandsir haunts the night a paradise a place where i could live in penury and gloom and be most blessed ah ora if there's misery in thraldom pity a wretch who breathes but in thy favour who till he looked upon that beauteous face was free and happy pity me or kill me kneeling and catching hold of her hand off fiend let snakes and vipers cling to me so thou dost keep aloof Rudiger, rising indignantly and is my love with so much hatred met madam beware lest scorn like this should change me even to the baleful thing your fears have fancied thirst thou to threaten me he who is mad with love and gold with scorn dares anything <sighs> but oh forgive such words from one who rather humbled at your feet would have that gentleness that generous pity the native inmate of each female breast receive the grace on which his life depends there was a time when thou didst look on me with other eyes thou dost amaze me much whilst i believed thou wert an honest man being no fool and an adventurous soldier i looked upon thee with good will if more thou didst discover in my looks than this i wisdom with thine honesty in truth was fairly matched madam the proud derision of that smile deceives me not it is the lord of falconstein who better skilled than i in tourney war though not in the actual field more valiant found engrosses now your partial thoughts and yet what may he boast which in a lover's suit i may not urge he's brave and so am i in birth i am his equal for my mother as i shall prove was married to count albert my noble father though for reasons tedious here to be stated still their secret nuptials were unacknowledged and on me has fallen a cruel stigma which degrades my fortunes but were i i oh, forgive the expiring thought but were i orus lord i should break forth like the unclouded sun by all acknowledged as ranking with the highest in the land do what thou wilt when thou art orus lord but being as thou art retire and leave me i choose to be alone then be it so thy pleasure mighty dame i will not balk this night to-morrow's night and every night shalt thou in solitude be left if absence of human beings can secure it for thee pauses and looks on her while she seems struck and disturbed it wears already on the midnight hour good night pauses again she is still more disturbed perhaps i understood too hastily commands you may retract aura recovering her state leave me i say that part of my commands i never can retract you are obeyed exit aura paces up and down hastily for some time 
then stop short, and after remaining a little while in a thoughtful posture, Can spirit from the tomb, or fiend from hell, more hateful, more malignant be than man, that villainous man? Although to look on such, yeah, even the very thought of looking on them makes natural blood to curdle in the veins and loosened limbs to shake. There are who have endured the visitation of supernatural beings. Oh, for fend it! I would close couch me to my deadliest foe rather than for a moment bear alone the horrors of the sight. Who's there? Who's there? Looking round. Heard I not voices near? That door ajar sends forth a cheerful light. Perhaps my women, who now prepare my chamber. Grant it be. Exit. Running hastily to a door from which a light is seen. Scene three. A chamber with a small bed or couch in it. Enter Rudiger and Katharina, wrangling together. I say, be gone and occupy the chamber I have appointed for thee. Here I am fixed, and here I pass the night. Thou saidst my chamber should be adjoining that which Aura holds? I know thy wicked thoughts. They meditate some devilish scheme. But think not I'll abet it. Thou wilt not, angry, restive, simple fool. Dost thou stop short and say, I'll go no further? Thou, whom concealed shame hath bound so fast, my tool, my instrument, fulfill thy charge to the full bent of thy commission, else thee and thy bantling too I'll from me cast to want and infamy. O oh, shameless man, thou art the son of a degraded mother, as low as I am, yet thou hast no pity. Aye. And dost thou reproach my bastardy to make more base the man who conquered thee with all thy virtue, rigid and demure? Who would have thought less than a sovereign prince could e'er have compassed such achievement? Mean as he may be, thou hast given thyself a master and must obey him. Dost thou yet resist? Thou knowest my meaning. Tearing open his vest in vehemence of action. <gasps> Under thy vest a dagger. <sighs> Too well I know thy meaning, cruel, ruthless man. Have I discovered it? I thought not of it. The vehemence of gesture hath betrayed me. Well, I keep it not for thee, but for myself. A refuge from disgrace. Here is another. He who with high but dangerous fortune grapples, should he be foiled, Looks but to friends like these. Pulling out two daggers from his vest. The steel is strong to give a vigorous thrust. The other on its venomed point has that which, in the feeblest hand, gives death as certain as though a giant smote the destined prey. Thou desperate man, so armed against thyself. I, against myself with such resolves, Consider well how I shall deal with those who may withstand my will or mar my purpose. Thinks thou well feebly. Oh, be pacified. I will be gone. I am a humbled wretch on whom thou tramplest with a tyrant's cruelty. Exit. Rediger looks after her with a malignant laugh, and then goes to the door of an adjoining chamber, to the lock of which he applies his ear. All oh, still within. I am tired and heavy grown. Now lay me down to rest. She is secure. No one can pass me here to gain her chamber. If she hold parley now with anything, it must in truth be ghost or sprite. I am. I am tired and will to bed. Lays himself on the couch and falls asleep. The cry of hounds is then heard without at a distance, with the sound of a horn. And presently, Aura enters, bursting from the door of the adjoining chamber in great alarm. Katrina, sleepest thou? Awake! 
awake. <gasps> Running up to the couch and starting back on seeing Rediger. That hateful viper here. Is this my nightly guard? Detested wretch. I will steal back again. Walks softly on tiptoe to the door of her chamber when the cry of hounds, etc., is again heard without, nearer than before. Oh, no, I dare not. Though sleeping and most hateful when awake, still he is natural life and may be waked. Listening again. Tis nearer now that dismal trilling blast. I must awake him. Approaching the couch and shrinking back again. Oh, no, no, no! Oh, upon his face he wears a horrid smile that speaks bad thoughts. Rediger speaks in his sleep. He mutters to my name. I dare not do it. Listening again. The dreadful sound is now upon the wind, sullen and low as if it wound its way into the caverned earth that swallowed it. I will abide in patient silence here. Though hateful and asleep, I feel me still near something of my kind. Crosses her arms and leans in a cowering posture over the back of a chair at a distance from the couch, when presently the horn is heard without, louder than before, and she starts up. Oh, it returns, as though the yawning earth had given it up again near to the walls. A horribly mingled din. Tis nearer still, tis close at hand, tis at the very gate. Running to the couch. Ah, were he a murderer clenching in his hands the bloody knife, I must awake him. No, that face of dark and subtile wickedness, I dare not do it. Listing again. Ay, it is at the gate. Within the gate. What rushing blast is that shaking the doors? Some awful visitation dread entrance makes. Oh, mighty God of heaven! A sound ascends the stairs. Ho, Rudiger! Awake! Awake! Ho! Wake thee, Rudiger! Rudiger, waking. <laughs> what cry is that so terribly strong? Ha! <sighs> Ora, what is the matter? It is within the walls. Didst thou not hear it? What? The loud voice that called me? No, it was mine. It sounded in my ears with more than human strength. Did it so sound? There is around us in this midnight air a power surpassing nature. List, I pray, although more distant now, dost thou not hear the yells of hounds, the spectre huntsman's horn? I hear indeed a strangely mingled sound. The wind is howling round the battlements. But rest secure where safety is, sweet aura. Within these arms, nor man nor fiend shall harm thee. Approaching her with a softened, winning voice, while she pushes him off with abhorrence. Vile reptile, touch me not! Ah, Aura, thou art warped by prejudice, and taught to think me base. But in my veins lives noble blood, which I will justify. But in thy heart, false traitor, what lives there? Alas, thy angel faultlessness conceives not the strong temptations of a soul impassioned beyond control of reason. At thy feet, kneeling, oh, spurn me not. Enter several servants, alarmed. What are these fools upon us? Staring knaves, what brings thee here at this untimely hour? We have all heard it. T'was the yell of hounds and clattering steeds. And a shrill horn between. Out on such folly. In very truth it passed close to the walls. Did your honor not hear it? Ha! Sayest thou so? Thou art not one to join in idle tales. Out to the battlements and watch it there. It may return again. Exeunt severally. Rediger followed by servants. And Aura into her own chamber. Scene 4. The Outlaw's Cave. 
Enter Theobald. Theobald, looking round. Here is a place in which some traces are of late inhabitants. In yonder nook the embers faintly gleam, and on the walls hang spears and ancient arms. I must be right. A figure through the gloom moves towards me. Ho oh, there! Whoe'er you are! Hola! Good friend! Enter an outlaw. A stranger! Who art thou who art thus bold to hail us here unbidden? That thou shalt shortly know. Thou art, I guess, one of the outlaws who this forest haunt. Be thy conjecture right or wrong, no more shalt thou return to tell where thou hast found us. Now for thy life! Drawing his sword. Hear me, I do entreat thee. Nay, nay, no foolish pleadings, for thy life is forfeit now. Have at thee! falls fiercely upon Theobald, who also draws and defends himself bravely, when another outlaw enters and falls likewise upon him. Theobald then recedes, fighting, till he gets his back to the wall of the cavern, and there defends himself stoutly. Enter Franco. Desist, I charge you. Fighting with a stranger? Two swords to one? A solitary stranger? We are discovered. Had he mastered me, he had returned to tell his mates above what neighbors in these nether caves they have. Let us dispatch him. No, thou hateful butcher. Dispatch a man alone and in our power. Who art thou, stranger? Who dost use thy sword with no mean skill? And in this perilous case, so bold and air in countenance maintainest? What brought thee hither? My name is Theobald of Falkenstein, to find the valiant captain of these bands and crave assistance of his generous arm. This is my business here. Franco, struck and agitated, to his men. Go, join your comrades in the further cave. Exeunt Outlaws And thou art Falkenstein? In truth thou art, in who thinks thou am I? Franco, the generous leader of those outlaws. So am I called, and by that name alone they know me, sporting on the mountain side, where Garva's wood waves green in other days, some fifteen years ago, they called me Albert. Theobald, rushing into his arms. Albert! My playmate Albert! Woe the day! What cruel fortune drove thee to this state? I'll tell thee all, but tell thou first to me, what is the aid thou camest here to ask? Ay, thou wert ever thus, still forward bent to serve, not to be served. But wave we this. Last night a lady to the castle came, in thraldom by a villain kept, whom I, even with my life, would rescue. Of armed force, at present destitute, I come to thee, craving thy aid in counsel and in arms. When didst thou learn that outlaws harbor here? For tis but lately we have held these haunts. Not till within the precincts of the forest, following the traces of that villain's course, one of your band I met, and recognized as an old soldier, who, some few years back, had under my command right bravely served. Seeing himself discovered and encouraged by what I told him of my story, freely he offered to conduct me to his captain. But in a tangled path some space before me, alarmed at sight of spearmen through the break, he started from his way, and so I missed him, making to gain your cave my way alone. Thou art welcome here, and gladly I'll assist thee, though not by arms, the force within the castle, so far outnumbering mine, but other means may serve thy purpose better. What other means, I pray? From these low caves, a passage underground leads to the castle, to the very tower, where, as I guess, the lady is confined. When sleep has stilled the house, we'll make our way. Aye, 
By my faith it is a noble plan. Guarded or not, we well may overcome the few that may compose her midnight guard. We shall not shrink from that. But, by my fay, tomorrow is St. Michael's Eve. Twere well to be the spectre huntsman for a night, and bear her off without pursuit or hindrance. I comprehend thee not. Thou shalt ere long, but stand not here. An inner room I have, where thou shalt rest and some refreshment take, and then we'll more fully talk of this, which, slightly mentions, seems chimerical. Follow me. Turning to him as they go out. Hast thou still upon thine arm that mark which from mine arrow thou receivest when sportively we shot? The wound was deep, and galled thee much, but thou madest light of it. Yes, here it is. Pulling up his sleeve as they go out, and exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four of Aura, a tragedy in five acts, by Joanna Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One: The Ramparts of the Castle. Enter Aura and Katharina. Katharina, after a pause in which Aura walks once or twice across the stage thoughtfully go in i pray thou wanderest here too long a pause again <sighs> the air is cold behind those further mountains the sun is set i pray thee now go in ha huh. sets the sun already is the day indeed drawn to its close yes night approaches see Many a gathered flock of cawing rooks are to their nests returning. Night approaches. This awful night which living beings shrink from, all now of every kind scour to thy haunts, while darkness peopled with its hosts unknown awful dominion holds. Mysterious night, what things unutterable thy dark hours may lap, what from thy teeming darkness burst of horrid visitations ere that sun again shall rise on the enlightened earth a pause why dost thou gaze intently on the sky seest thou aught wonderful look there behold that strange gigantic form which yon grim cloud assumes rearing aloft the semblance of a warrior's plumed head while from its half-shaped arm a streamy dart shoots angrily? Behind him too far-stretched seems there not, verily, a serried line of fainter misty forms? I see, indeed, a vasty cloud of many clouds composed, towering above the rest, and that behind in misty faintness seen, which has some likeness to a long line of rocks with pine-wood crowned. Or, if indeed the fancy so incline, a file of spearmen seen through drifted smoke nay look how perfect now the form becomes dost thou not see ay and more perfect still o oh, thou gigantic lord whose robed limbs beneath their stride span half the heavens art thou of lifeless vapour formed art thou not rather some air-clad spirit some portentous thing some missioned being such a sky as this ne'er ushered in a night of nature's rest nay many such i've seen regard it not that form already changing will ere long dissolve to nothing tarry here no longer go in i pray no while one gleam remains of the sun's blessed light i will not go then let me fetch a cloak to keep thee warm for chilly blows the breeze. Do as thou wilt. Exit Katharina. Enter an outlaw, 
stealing softly behind her. Lady, the Lady Aura. Aura, starting. Ah, heaven protect me. Sounds it beneath my feet, in earth or air? He comes forward. Welcome is aught that wears a human face. Didst thou not hear a sound? What sound ain't please you? A voice which called me now. It spoke me thought in a low, hollow tone, suppressed and low, unlike a human voice. It was my own. What wouldst thou have? Here is a letter, lady. Who sent thee hither? It will tell thee all. Gives a letter. I must be gone. Your chieftain is at hand. Exit. Comes it from Falkenstein? It is his seal. I may not read it here. I'll to my chamber. Exit hastily, not perceiving Gredegar, who enters by the opposite side before she has time to get off. A letter in her hand, in such haste. Some secret agent here from Falkenstein. It must be so. Hastening after her. Exit. Scene two. The Outlaw's Cave. Enter Theobald and Franco by opposite sides. How now, good captain? Draws it near the time? Are those the keys? They are. This doth unlock the entrance to the staircase, known alone to Gomez, ancient keeper of the castle, who is my friend in secret and deters the neighboring peasantry with dreadful tales from visiting by night our wide domains. The other doth unlock a secret door that leads us to the chamber where she sleeps. Thanks, generous friend. Thou art my better genius. Didst thou not say, until the midnight horn hath sounded thrice, we must remain concealed? Even so. And now I hear my men without, telling the second watch. How looks the night? As we could wish, the stars do faintly twinkle, through severed clouds, and shed but light sufficient to show each nearer object closing on you in dim, unshapely blackness. Aught that moves across your path, or sheep, or straggling goat, is now a pawing steed, or grisly bull, large and terrific. Every air moved bush, or jutting crag, some strange, gigantic thing. Is all still in the castle? There is an owl sits hooting on the tower, that answer from a distant mate receives, like the faint echo of his dismal cry, while a poor houseless dog, by dreary fits, sits howling at the gate. All else is still. Each petty circumstance is in our favor that makes the night more dismal. Aye, all goes well. As I approach the walls, I heard two sentinels, for now I ween, the boldest spearmen will not watch alone, together talk in the deep hollow voice of those who speak at midnight, under awe of the dead stillness round them. Then let us put ourselves in readiness, and heaven's good favor guide us. Exeunt. Scene three. A gloomy apartment. Enter Aura and Redeker. Aura, aside. The room is darkened. Yesternight a lamp did shed its light around on roof and walls, and made the dreary space appear less dismal. Rediger, overhearing her, and calling to a servant without. Oh, more lights here. Servant enters with a light, and exit. Thou art obeyed, and not but in the company of humankind thou shalt be gratified. Thy lofty mind for higher superhuman fellowship, if such there be, may now prepare its strength. Thou ruthless tyrant, they who have in battle fought valiantly, shrink a helpless child from any intercourse with things unearthly. Art thou a man, and bearst thou in thy breast the feelings of a man? 
It cannot be. Yes, madam. In my breast I bear too keenly the feelings of a man. A man most wretched. A scorned, rejected man. Make me less miserable. Nay, rather should I say, make me more blessed. And then... Attempting to take her hand while she steps back from him, drawing herself up with an air stately and determined, and looking steadfastly in his face. I am too firm. Thou knowest my fixed resolve. Give me thy solemn promise to be mine. This is the price, thou haughty scornful maid, that will redeem thee from the hour of terror. This is the price. Which never shall be paid. Walks from him to the further end of the apartment. Rediger, after a pause. Thou art determined, then. Be not so rash. Bethink thee well what flesh and blood can bear. The hour is near at hand. She, turning round, waves him with her hand to leave. Thou deign'st no answer. Well, reap the fruits of thine unconquered pride. Exit. Mane Ora. I am alone. That closing door divides me from every being owning nature's life. And shall I be constrained to hold communion with that which owns it not? After pacing to and fro for a while. Oh, that my mind could raise its thoughts in strong and steady fervor to him, the lord of all existing things, who lives and is where'er existence is, grasping its hold upon his skirted robe, beneath whose mighty rule angels and spirits, demons and nether powers, all living things, hosts of the earth, with the departed dead in their dark state of mystery alike subjected are. And I will strongly do it. Ah, oh, would I could! Some hidden powerful hindrance doth hold me back, and mars all thought. After a pause, in which she stands fixed with her arms crossed on her breast. Dread intercourse! Oh, if it look on me with its dead eyes, if it should move its locked and earthy lips and utterance give to the grave's hollow sounds, if it stretch forth its cold and bony grasp, oh, horror, horror! Sinking lower at every successive idea as she repeats these four last lines, till she is quite upon her knees on the ground, would that beneath these planks of senseless matter I could, until the dreadful hour is past, as senseless be. Striking the floor with her hands. Oh, open and receive me, ye happy things of still and lifeless being, that to the awful steps which tread upon ye unconscious are. Enter Katharina behind her. Who's there? Is there anything? "'Tis I, my dearest lady, tis Katrina. Aura, embracing her. Oh, "'How kind, such blessed kindness! Keep thee by me, I'll hold thee fast. An angel brought thee hither. I needs must weep to think thou art so kind in mine extremity. Where wert thou hid?' "'In that small closet since the supper hour I've been concealed. For searching round the chamber I found its door and entered.' Fear not now, I will not leave thee till the break of day. Oh, heaven bless thee for it, till the break of day. The very thought of daybreak gives me life. If but this night were past, I have good hope that noble Theobald will soon be here for my deliverance. Wherefore thinkst thou so? A stranger, when thou leftst me on the ramparts, gave me a letter which I quickly opened, as soon as I, methought, had gained my room in privacy. But close behind me came that demon, Rudiger, and snatched at it, forced me to cast it to the flames, from which, I struggling with him still, he could not save it. You have not read it, then? No, but the seal was Theobald's, and I could swear ere long he will be here to free me from this thraldom. God grant he may. 
if but this night were past how goes the time has it not entered on the midnight watch katharina pointing to a small slab at the corner of the stage on which is placed a sand glass that glass i've set to measure it as soon as all the sand is run you are secure the midnight watch is past aura running to the glass and looking at it eagerly there is not much to run oh aren't we finished but it so slowly runs yes watching it it seemeth slow but heed it not the while i'll tell thee some old tale and ere i've finished the midnight watch is gone sit down i pray they sit aura drawing her chair close to katharina what story shall i tell thee something my friend which thou thyself hast known touching the awful intercourse which spirits with mortal men have held at this dread hour didst thou thyself ere meet with one whose eyes had looked upon the spectred dead had seen forms from another world never but once once then thou didst oh tell it tell it me well since i needs must tell it once i knew a melancholy man who did aver that journeying on a time over wild waste by a fell storm overtaken he was compelled to pass the night in a deserted tower where a poor hind the sole inhabitant of the sad place prepared for him a bed and as he told his tale at dead of night by the pale lamp that in his chamber burned as it might be an arm's length from his bed so close upon him yes go on what saw he an upright form wound in a clotted shroud clotted and stiff like one swathed up in haste after a bloody death oh horrible he started from his bed and gazed upon it and did he speak to it he could not speak its visage was uncovered and at first seemed fixed and shrunk like one in coffin sleep but as he gazed there came he wist not how into its beamless eyes a horrid glare and turning towards him for it did move why dost thou grasp me thus go on go on nay heaven forfend thy shrunk and sharpened features are of the coarsest colour and thine eyes are full of tears how is this i know not how a horrid sympathy jarred on my heart and forced into mine eyes these icy tears a fearful kindredship there is between the living and the dead an awful bond woe is me that we do shudder at ourselves at that which we must be a dismal thought where dost thou run thy story is not told seeing katharina go towards the sand glass katharina showing the glass a better story i will tell thee now the midnight watch is past ha let me see there's not one sand to run but it is barely past tis more than past for i did set it later than the hour to be assuredly sure oh, then it is gone indeed oh heaven be praised the fearful gloom gone by holding up her hands in gratitude to heaven and then looking round her with cheerful animation in truth already i feel as if i breathed the morning air a marvellously lightened nevertheless thou art forspent i'll run to my apartment and fetch some cordial drops that will revive thee thou needst not go i've taken thy drops already i'm bold and buoyant grown bounding lightly from the floor i'll soon return thou art not fearful now no i breathe lightly valor within me grows most powerfully wouldst thou but stay to see it gentle catherine i will return to see it ere thou canst three times repeat the letters of thy name exit hastily by the concealed door aura alone <sighs> this burst of courage shrinks most shamefully 
I'll follow her. Striving to open the door. Tis fast. It will not open. I'll count my footsteps as I pace the floor till she return again. Paces up and down, muttering to herself, when a horn is heard without, pausing and sounding three times, each time louder than before. Aura runs again to the door. Despair will give me strength. Where is the door? Mine eyes are dark. I cannot find it now. Oh, God, protect me in this awful pass. After a pause, in which she stands with her body bent in a cowering posture, with her hands locked together and trembling violently, she starts up and looks wildly round her. There is nothing, yet I felt a chilly hand upon my shoulder pressed. With opened eyes and ears intent I'll stand. Better it is thus to abide the awful visitation then cower in blinded horror, strained intensely with every beating of my goaded heart. Looking round her with a steady sternness, but shrinking again almost immediately. Ah! I cannot do it. On this spot I'll hold me in awful stillness. Bending her body as before, then, after a momentary pause, pressing both her hands upon her head, the icy scalp of fear is on my head the life stirs in my hair it is a sense that tells the nearing of unearthly steps albeit my ringing ears no sounds distinguish looking round as if by irresistible impulse to a great door at the bottom of the stage which bursts open and the form of a huntsman clothed in black with a horn in his hand enters and advances towards her she utters a loud shriek and falls senseless on the ground theobald running to her and raising her from the ground no semblance but real agony of fear aura oh aura knowest thou not my voice thy knight thy champion the devoted theobald Open thine eyes and look upon my face. Unmasking. I am no fearful waker from the grave. Dost thou not feel? Tis the warm touch of life. Look up and fear will vanish. Words are vain. What a pale countenance of ghastly strength by horror changed. Oh, idiot that I was to hazard this. The villain has deceived me. My letter she has ne'er received. Oh, fool, that I should trust to this. Beating his head distractedly. Enter Franco by the same door. What is the matter? What strange turn is this? Oh, cursed sanguine fool! Could I not think? She moves, she moves. Rouse thee, my gentle aura. Tis no strange voice that calls thee. "'Tis thy friend!' "'She opens now her eyes. "'But, oh, that look!' "'She knows thee not, but gives a stifled groan, "'and sinks again in stupor. "'Make no more fruitless lamentation here, "'but bear her hence. "'The cool and open air may soon restore her. "'Let us, while we may, occasion seize, lest we should be surprised. Exeunt. Aura borne off in a state of insensibility. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Aura A Tragedy in Five Acts by Joanna Bailey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One The Great Hall of the Castle. Enter Rudiger, Katharina, and Attendants by different doors. Rudiger to Attendant. 
returned again is anything discovered or door or passage garment dropped in haste or footsteps track or any mark of flight no by my faith though from its heights turrets to its deep vaults the castle we have searched tis vain to trace the marks of trackless feet if that in truth it has conveyed her hands the yawning earth has yielded them a passage or else through rifted roofs the buoyant air fools search again i'll raise the very walls from their foundations but i will discover if door or pass there be to us unknown calling off the stage home gomez there he keeps himself aloof nor aids the search with true and hearty will i am betrayed oh gomez there i say shrinks away go drag the villain hither and let the torture wring confession from him a loud knocking heard at the gate ha ah, who seeks entrance at this early hour in such a desert place some hind perhaps who brings intelligence heaven grant it be enter an armed vassal ha ah, one from aldenburg what brings thee hither vassal seizing rudiger thou art my prisoner to attendance upon your peril assist me to secure him audacious hind by what authority speaks thou such bold commands produce thy warrant tis at the gate and such as thou must yield to count hugobert himself with armed men a goodly band his pleasure to enforce secures him what sudden freak is this am i suspected of aught but true and honourable faith ay by our holy saints more than suspected thy creature maurice whom thou thoughtest to bribe with things of seeming value hath discovered the cunning fraud on which his tender conscience good soul did all the sudden so upbraid him that to his lord forthwith he made confession of all the plots against the lady aura in which thy wicked arts had tempted him to take a wicked part all is discovered katharina aside all is discovered where then shall i hide me aloud to vassal what is discovered ha most virtuous lady art thou alarmed fear not the world well knows how good thou art and to the countess shortly who with her lord is near thou wilt no doubt give good account of all that thou hast done katharina aside as she retires in agitation oh heaven forbid what hole of the earth will hide me exit enter by the opposite side hugobert eleonora alice glottenball erston maurice and attendants hugobert speaking as he enters is he secured he is my lord behold pointing to rudiger hugobert to rudiger black artful traitor of a sacred trust blindly reposed in thee the base betrayer for wicked ends full well upon the ground mayst thou decline those darkly frowning eyes and gnaw thy lip in shame and rests no shame with him whose easy faith entrusts a man unproved or having proved him let some poor hirelings unsupported testimony shake the firm confidence of many years here the accuser stands confront him boldly and spare him not bringing forth maurice maurice to rudiger deny it if thou canst thou brazen front all brazen as it is denies it not rudiger to maurice fool let of prying curiosity and avarice art compound it i in truth did give to thee a counterfeited treasure to bribe thee to a counterfeited trust 
meet recompense. <laughs> Maintain thy tale, for I deny it not. Oh, subtle traitor, dost thou so varnish it with seeming mirth? Sir Rudiger, thou dost, I must confess, outface him well. But call the Lady Aura. If towards her thou hast thyself comported in honesty, she will declare it freely. To attendant. Bring Aura hither. Would that we could. Last night, in the midnight watch, she disappeared. Whether man or devil hath borne her hands, we cannot tell. Oh, both. Both man and devil together joined. To Rediger, furiously. Fiend, villain, murderer, produce her instantly. Dead or alive, produce thy hapless charge. Restrain your rage, my lord. I would right gladly obey you, were it possible. The place and the mysterious means of her retreat are both to me unknown. Thou liest, thou liest. Glottenball, coming forward. Thou liest, beast, villain, traitor. Think'st thou still to fool us thus? Thou shalt be forced to speak. To Hugobert. Why lose we time in words when other means will quickly work? Straight to those pillars bind him, and let each sturdy varlet of your train inflict correction on him. I, this alone, will move him. Thou sayest well, by heaven it shall be done. And will Count Hugobert degrade in me the blood of Aldenberg to shame himself? That plea avails thee not. Thy spurious birth gives us full warrant, as thy conduct varies, to reckon thee or noble or debased. To attendant. Straight bind the traitor to the place of shame. As they are struggling to bind Rudiger, he gets one of his hands free, and, pulling out a dagger from under his clothes, stabs himself. Now take your will of me, and drag my course through mire and dust. Your shameless fury now can do me no disgrace. Erston, advancing. Rash, daring, thoughtless wretch! Dost thou so close a wicked life in hardy desperation? Priest, spare thy words. I add not to my sins that of presumption in pretending now to offer up to heaven the false repentance of some short moments of a life of crimes. My son, thou dost mistake me. Let thy heart confession make. Yes, dog. Confession make of what thou'st done with horror, else I'll spurn thee and cast thy hateful carcass to the kites. Hugobert, pulling back Glottenball as he is going to spurn Rudiger with his foot, who has now fallen upon the ground. Nay, nay, forbear. Such outrage is unmanly. Eleonora, who with Alice had retired from the shocking sight of Rudiger, now comes forward to him. Oh, Rudiger, thou art... A dying man, and we will speak to thee without upbraiding. Confess, I do entreat thee, ere thou goest to thy most awful change, and leave us not in this our horrible uncertainty. Is Aura here concealed? Thou hast not slain her. Confession make, and heaven have mercy on thee. Yes, ladies, with these words of gentle meekness my heart is changed. And that you may perceive how greatly changed, let Glottenbaum approach me. Spend him I now, and can but faintly speak. Even unto him in token of forgiveness, I'll tell what he desire. Thank heaven thou art so changed. Hugobert to Glottenbaum. Go to him, boy. Glottenbaum goes to Rudiger, and stooping over him to hear what he has to say. Rudiger, taking a small dagger from his bosom, strikes Glottenball on the neck. Oh, he has wounded me! Detested traitor! Take that! And that! 
Wouldst thou had still a life for every thrust? Killing him. Ha! Ah, he has wounded thee, my son? A scratch. Tis nothing more. He aimed it at my throat, but had not the strength to thrust. Thank God he had not. A trumpet sounds without. Hark! Marshal notice of some high approach. To attendants. Go to the gate. Exeunt attendants. Who may it be? This castle is remote from every route which army leaders take. Enter a servant. The banneret of Basil is at the gate. Is he in force? Yes. Through the trees his distant bands are seen some hundred strong, I guess. Though with himself, two followers only come. Enter Hartman, attended. Forgive me, Banneret, if I receive thee with more surprise than courtesy. How is it? Comes thou in peace? To you, my lord, I frankly will declare the purpose of my coming. Having heard it, it is for you to say if I am come, as much as I wish, in peace. To Eleonora. Countess. Your presence much emboldens me to think it so shall be. Proceed, I beg. When burghers gently courtesy affect, it chafes me more than all their sturdy boasting. Then with a burghers plainness, Hugo Bird, I'll try my tale to tell. Nice task, I fear, so that it may not gall a baron's pride. Brave Theobald, the lord of Falkenstein, co-burger also of our ancient city, whose cause, of course, is ours, declares himself the suitor of thy ward, the Lady Aura, and learning that within these walls she is, by thine authority, endurance kept, in his behalf I come to set her free, as an oppressed dame such service claiming from every generous knight. What is thy answer? Say, am I come in peace? Wilt thou release her? Ah, would I could. In faith thou gallst me shrewdly. I've been informed of all that now disturbs you by one who held me waiting at the gate. Until the maid be found, if tis your pleasure, cease enmity. Then let it cease. A traitor has deceived me, and there he lies. Pointing to the body of Rediger. Hartman, looking at the body. A ghastly smile of fell malignity on his distorted face death has arrested. Turning again to Hugobert. And has he died and no confession made? All means that may discover Aura's fate shut from us? Ah, the fiend hath uttered nothing that could betray his secret. If she lives... Alas, alas, think you he murdered her? Merciful heaven, forfend! Enter a soldier in haste. Oh, I have heard a voice, a dismal voice. What, what hast thou heard? heard? What voice? The Lady Aura's. Where? Lead us to the place. Where didst thou hear it, soldier? In a deep tangled thicket of the wood, close to a ruined wall, overgrown with ivy. That marks the ancient outworks of the castle. Haste, lead the way. Exeunt all eagerly, without order, following the soldier, glutton ball, and one attendant accepted. You do not go, my lord? I'm sick, and strangely dizzy grows my head, and pains shoot from my wound. It is a scratch, but from a devil's fang. There's mischief in it. Give me thine arm and lead me to a couch. I am very faint. This way, my lord. There is a chamber near. Exeunt Glottenball, supported by the attendant. Scene two. The forest near the castle, in front of a rocky bank, crowned with a ruined wall overgrown with ivy, and the mouth of a cavern shaded with bushes. Enter Franco, 
conducting Hugobert, Hartman, Eleonora, Alice, and Erston, the soldier following them. Franco de Hugobert. This is the entry to our secret haunts, and now, my lord, having informed you truly of the device well meant but most unhappy by which the lady aura from her prison by falkenstein was taken myself my outlaws unhappy men who better days have seen drove to this lawless life by hard necessity are on your mercy cast which shall not fail you valiant franco much am i indebted to thee hadst thou not of thine own free good will become our guide as wandering here thou found'st us we had ne'er the spot discovered for this honest soldier a stranger to the forest sought in vain to thread the tangled path eleonora to franco she is not well thou sayest and from her swoon imperfectly recovered when i left her she so appeared but enter not i pray till i give notice hola you within come forth and fear no ill a shriek heard from the cave ah! what dismal shriek is that tis aura's voice no no it cannot be it is some wretch in maniac's fetters bound the horrid thought that bursts into my mind forbid it righteous heaven running into the cave he is prevented by theobald who rushes out upon him hold hold no entry here but o'er my corpse when ye have mastered me my theobald dost thou not know thy friends ah thou my hartman art thou come to me yes i am come what means that look of anguish she is not dead oh no it is not death what meanst thou is she well her body is and not her mind o oh, direst wreck of all that noble mind but tis some passing seizure some powerful movement of a transient nature it is not madness theobald shrinking from him and bursting into tears tis heaven's infliction let us call it so give it no other name covering his face eleonora to theobald nay do not thus despair when she beholds us she'll know her friends and by our kindly soothing be gradually restored let me go to her nay forbear i pray thee i will myself with thee my worthy hartman go in and lead her forth theobald and hartman go into the cavern while those without wait in deep silence which is only broken once or twice by a scream from the cavern and the sound of Theobald's voice speaking soothingly, till they return, leading forth Aura, with her hair and dress disordered, and the appearance of wild distraction in her gait and countenance. Aura, shrinking back as she comes from under the shade of the trees, etc., and dragging Theobald and Hartman back with her. Come back! Come back! the fierce and fiery light shrink not dear love it is the light of day have cocks crowed yet yes twice i've heard already their matin sound look up to the blue sky is it not daylight there and these green boughs are fresh and fragrant round thee every sense tells thee it is the cheerful early day ay so it is they takes his daily turn rising between the gulfy dells of night like whitened billows on a gloomy sea till glow-worms gleam and stars peep through the dark and will o'er the wisp his dancing taper light they will not come again bending her ear to the ground hark hark ay hark they are all there i hear their hollow sound full many a fathom down 
be still poor troubled soul they'll ne'er return they are for ever gone be well assured thou shalt from henceforth have a cheerful home with crackling faggots on thy midnight fire blazing like day round thee and thy friends thy living loving friends still by thy side to speak to thee and cheer thee see my aura they are beside thee now dost thou not know them pointing to eleonora and alice aura gazing at them with her hand held up to shade her eyes no no athwart the wavering garish light things move and seem to be and yet are nothing eleonora going near her my gentle aura hast thou then forgot me dost thou not know my voice mm, it is like an old tune to my ear returned for there be those who sit in cheerful halls and breathe sweet air and speak with pleasant sounds and once i lived with such some years gone by i watch not now how long keen words that rend my heart thou hadst a home and one whose faith was pledged for thy protection be more composed my lord some faint remembrance returns upon her with the well-known sound of voices once familiar to her ear let alice sing to her some favourite tune that may lost thoughts recall alice sings an old tune and aura who listens eagerly and gazes on her while she sings afterwards bursts into a wild laugh <laughs> Witched air sings for thee bravely. Ah, hood owls throw mantling fog for matin birds. It lures not me. I know thee well enough. Bones of murdered men thy measure beat, and fleshless heads nod to thee. Off I say, why are ye here? That is the blessed sun. Ah, Aura, do not look upon us thus. These are the voices of thy loving friends that speak to thee. This is a friendly hand that presses thine so kindly. Putting her hand upon Aura's, who gives a loud shriek and shrinks from her with horror. O oh, grievous state! Going up to her. What terror seizes thee? Take it away! Ah, oh, it was the swath it did! I know its clammy, chill, and bony touch. Fixing her eyes fiercely on Eleonora. Come not again! I am strong and terrible now. Mine eyes have looked upon all dreadful things. And when the earth yawns and the hell blast sounds, I'll bide the trooping of unearthly steps with stiff clenched terrible strength. Holding her clenched hands over her head with an air of grandeur and defiance, Hugobert, beating his breast. A murderer is a guiltless wretch to me. Be patient. Tis a momentary pitch. Let me encounter it. Goes up to Aura and fixes his eyes upon her, which she, after a moment, shrinks from and seeks to avoid, yet still, as if involuntarily, looks at him again. <sighs> Take off from me thy strangely fastened eye. I may not look upon thee. Yet I must. Still turning from him, and still snatching a hasty look at him, as before. Unfix thy baleful glance, art thou a snake? Something of horrid power within thee dwells. Still, still that powerful eye doth suck me in, like a dark eddy to its wheeling core. Spare me. Oh, spare me, being of strange power, and at thy feet my subject head I'll lay. Kneeling to Hartman, 
and bending her head submissively. Alas, the piteous sight, to see her thus, the noble, generous, playful, stately aura. Theobald, running to Hartman, and pushing him away with indignation. Out on thy hateful and ungenerous guile! Thinkest thou I'll suffer over her wretched state the slightest shadow of a base control? Raising Gora from the ground. No, rise, thou stately flower, with rude blasts rent, as honoured art thou with thy broken stem, and leave it strewn, as in thy summer's pride. I've seen thee worshipped like a regal dame, with every studied form of marked devotion, whilst I, in distant silence, scarcely proffered even a plain soldier's courtesy. But now, no liege man to its crowned mistress sworn, bound and devoted is as I to thee and he who offers to thy altered state the slightest seeming of diminished reverence must in my blood to hartman oh pardon me my friend thou strung my heart nay do thou pardon me i am to blame thy nobler heart shall not again be wrung but what can now be done or such wild ravings there must be some control oh none 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 but gentle sympathy and watchfulness of love my noble aura wander where'er thou wilt thy vagrant steps shall followed be by one who shall not weary nor e'er detach him from his hopeless task bound to thee now as fairest gentlest beauty could ne'er have bound him see how she gazes on him with a look subsiding gradually to softer sadness half saying that she knows him there is a kindness in her changing eye yes aura tis the valiant theobald thy knight and champion whom thou gazest on the brave are like the brave so should it be he was a goodly man a noble knight to theobald what is thy name young soldier woe is me for prayers of grace are said o'er dying men yet they have laid thy clay in unblessed earth shame shame not with the stilled and holy dead this shall be rectified i'll find it out and masses shall be said for thy repose thou shalt not troop with these tis not the dead tis Theobald himself alive and well who standeth by thy side aura looking wildly round where where all dreadful things are near me round me beneath my feet and in the loaded air let him be gone the place is horrible baneful to flesh and blood the dreadful blast their hounds now yell below in the centre gulf they may not rise again till solemn bells have given the stroke that severs night from morn oh rave not thus dost thou not know us aura ay well enough i know ye ha think ye that she does it is a terrible smile of recognition if such it be nay do not thus your restless eyeballs move but look upon us steadily sweet aura away your faces waver to and fro i'll know you better in your winding sheets when the moon shines upon ye give o'er my friends you see it is in vain her mind within itself holds a dark world of dismal fantasies and horrid forms Contend with her no more. Enter an attendant in an abrupt, disturbed manner. Attendant to Eleonora, aside. Lady, I bring you most dismal news. Too grievous for my lord, so suddenly and unprepared to hear. Eleonora, aside. What is it? Speak. Attendant, aside to Eleonora. His son is dead, all swelled 
and racked with pain, and on the dagger's point, which the slight traitor is still in his stiffens grasp retains, foul stains, like those of lime poison, show full well the weak cause of his untimely death. Hugobert, overhearing them. Who speaks of death? What didst thou whisper there? How is my son? What look is that thou wearest? He is not dead. Thou dost not speak. O oh God, I have no son. After a pause. I am bereft, but this, but only him. Heaven's vengeance deals the stroke. Heaven often mercy smites, even when the blows of Erist is. I had no other hope. Fell is the stroke, if mercy in it be. Could this, could this alone atone my crime? Submit thy soul to heaven's all-wise decree. Perhaps his life had blasted more thy hopes than even his grievous end. He was not all a father's heart could wish. But, oh, he was my son, my only son, my child, the thing that from his cradle grew and was before me still. Oh, 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 oh! Beating his breast and groaning deeply. Aura, running up to him. Ha! Dost thou groan, old man? Art thou in trouble? Out on it! Though they lay him in the mould, he's near thee still. I'll tell thee how it is. A hideous burst hath been, the damned and holy, the living and the dead together are in horrid neighbourship. Tis but thin vapour floating around thee makes the wavering bound. Pow! Blow it off and see the uncurtained reach. See, from all points they come, earth casts them up. In grave clothes swathed are those but new in death. And there be some half bone, half cased in shreds of that which flesh hath been, and there be some with wicked ribs through which the darkness scowls. Back, back! They close upon us. Oh, the void of hollow, unbald sockets staring grimly, and lipless jaws that move and clatter round in mockery of speech. Back! Back, I say, back, back. Catching hold of Hugobert and Theobald, and dragging them back with her in all the wild strength of frantic horror, whilst the curtain drops. The End of Aura End of Act 5 End of Aura A Tragedy in Five Acts by Joanna Bailey